these phases of insight, I just wanted to um, mention first that um, I sent out a, a link to a talk that I gave on retreat recently going over these phases in depth, uh, the phases in our seeking, effort, breakthrough, disillusionment, equanimity, completion. And I, I'm not going to get into detail here about the phases, but just to kind of say that um, this is a model that describes or attempts to describe a, a general learning process that, that we go through. It's, it's, it's a model about learning, essentially, but applied to um, the contemplative or meditative path in particular. And um, in it, it just sort of describes these sort of phases of learning that I, that I, I seem to, to notice are, are pretty universal. They're fairly universal. Um, we start with first seeking. You know, we're looking for something. There's a problem. There's some lack. And then we have to do something about it. We have to put effort forth to find some kind of solution or to do something to try to resolve that. Eventually, we do find some kind of resolution or insight or a breakthrough around the issue. Something clicks. We understand it in a deeper way or in a new way, in a different way. Uh, and then there is the disillusionment process that seems to follow that breakthrough because now we see the world differently or we see things differently, but it's not like we've integrated that fully yet into our being. There's a process of letting go of the old uh, view of the old self uh, and of grieving that loss um, and of seeing you know, what, what's actually changed after this, this big breakthrough moment. Sometimes it's not as much as we'd hope. Uh, eventually, as, as we can let go and let be uh, and see how things really shake out after being at the top of the mountain, uh, then th th there's this sort of growing sense of equanimity, of uh, allowing, of trusting, of ordinariness, of just being alive. And that culminates in a kind of moment of, of completion, of, of really uh, things coming together uh, in, in a kind of seeing without seeing knowing without knowing, um, a, a moment of fruition, as it's described in the tradition. And that, that's really a, um, it's a, it's a life, can be a life transforming um, experience. Now I'm describing these as a kind of progression, right? It's like we're moving one, two, three, four, five, six through the phases. And, and, and that would be, and that does happen and it happens often. And, and I would call that like progress. And so we, sometimes we can make progress through these phases, but I don't call this the progress of insight or the stages of insight. We decided to call it the phases of insight because um, this, for, this learning process to me, it's, it's a natural process. It's, it's of nature. And um, in the same way that the moon th moves through these natural phases uh, from, from there being no visible moon from our perception to there being full moon, uh, which was just this morning, I think at 8.30. <laughs> um, the, uh, in the same way, our learning, because we're part of nature, uh, goes through phases. Um, in the same way that matter moves through phases, you know, solid, liquid, gas, plasma, changing form, finding these sort of stable, temporary stable places, and then kind of moving up or down from there. So too, we seem to move through these phases to find uh, kind of ourselves located somewhere for a while and seeing things in a certain way, and then it shifts. Sometimes we move forward, sometimes we move back, sometimes we jump around. Um, and that's why I also use the term phases because it's not always linear. This process is not, it's not always linear. It's often nonlinear. It's often, you know, it, it, it's jumbly. Um, it moves in waves. You know, it's, it's not so clear cut and discreet as we, I think uh, we analytical types want it to be. Um, and so this is an attempt, this model is an attempt to describe uh, the complexity of, of the journey of learning. And uh, in terms of metadharma, you know, in the context that we're exploring this month, um, which as I said last week is uh, any approach to dharma practice, which tries to respond to the meta crisis, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the overlapping crises that we face uh, as a human species and, and as a planetary mm -hmm. um, environment. Um, this waking up, uh, this map is about waking up. It's the traditional awakening journey, you know, of uh, seeing through the self, 
uh, of, of noticing that the self is a process, a construct. It's a, it's a process of identification, of referencing ideas and feelings and sensations and, and of being like, oh, this is who I am. Um, but we actually look at that and we see clearly, oh, no, this isn't all of who I am. And part of the reason I'm suffering is because I've taken myself to be something uh, which is discreet. And then when reality doesn't match up with what I think I am, then there's an existential rope burn. So we're waking up. We're um, moving through these phases, cycling through them, deepening through them. Um, and, 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 and to me, that, that process is, is, is endless. There's an endless possible uh, enlargement to this awakening um, that can happen. Um, but it's very important to differentiate and dis, uh, distinguish between awakening, um, which one of my mentors, Ken Wilber, called horizontal enlightenment. If you kind of imagine it, it's being like on this axis. And then uh, growing up. There's waking up and there's growing up. Uh, and, and if you've hung around any Buddhist scenes or spiritual traditions, or really, I think, around other human beings that are interested in this stuff, um, you've probably noticed there, there can be some very brilliantly awake people uh, or, or people that dis- exhibit profound wisdom, but then simultaneously can be complete assholes. <laughs> and in fact, if, the more you hang around with the most awake people, the more you realize there is no one who isn't this way. <laughs> you know, everyone. Uh, has blind spots and things they're working on or confused about um, immaturities, you know, ways that they haven't integrated this insight into in these insights into how they live. And, and for me, growing up, it describes a different kind of development where it's instead of dissolving the self, we're actually expanding the self. Uh, we're actually working on a maturing and developing our self. Um, and we're moving in general terms from the self being quite small and narrow, the egocentric self, the I only, to more of an ethnocentric sense of self of actually being able to include each other uh, in, our, in our awareness and in our care and a sense of who we are, um, including our families, our tribes, our, you know, the, the, the ethnic communities that we're part of, the ethnocentric. The, then we can hopefully... Uh, Not everyone does this, but we can hopefully expand the self to be bigger than that, the bigger than our groups and our, and our in groups so that we're actually identifying in some way with all people, um, with all humans. We're seeing that we're all interconnected. Uh, We're all a global family. Even when someone, you know, some group or nation tries to be, to isolate themselves from the rest of the world, there is no isolate. There's no true isolation <laughs> um, by pulling away that affects everyone. Um, and so we are a global family. And uh, wow, uh, that metaphor is disturbing too because there's a lot of dysfunction in this family. <laughs> um, and you know, and and I think that's recognizing that and recognizing kind of the limitations of the human is part of what can open up into a broader sense of self, even. Uh, the planet centric self, you know, it's where we actually can identify with the whole uh, ecosystem that we're embedded in and part of, you know, again, experiencing ourselves as nature, uh, not nature separate from humans, but like part of nature that's like learned how to wreck the, the very substrate that we exist in. Like we somehow learned how to debase. We're the first species that we know of that's learned how to debase ourselves. So yay, congrats, humans. Um, but hopefully as we, as we get, you know, grow up further, we start to recognize that. Uh, and that it's not just about humans. It's not just about um, what we can create with our technology, what we can do to make ourselves more comfortable. Actually, all of our actions have an impact on this broader earth that we're uh, existing on. Um, and so that to me is the process of growing up and one can be ethnocentric and deeply awake, or one can be, you know, identifying with the whole planet and not necessarily have gone through this ego dissolution process. So these are semi-independent axes of development. Um, and yet they're both important. Um, because if we're not, if we're not grown up, we can't respond to the crisis. So we have to grow up. And if we're not awakened, uh, it's hard to not take this so damn seriously. Like, it literally is the end of the world. Well, yeah, no, but we're all going to die. It is the end of the world anyway. <laughs> um, so there's some peace that can be found, I think, in that that liberates, liberates us in some way 
and even liberates us to act more appropriately. Um, so that's why we're exploring both of these together, waking up and growing up, um, so that hopefully we can, we can be better vessels um, for, um, for this response that's needed you know, at this point, at this phase in our, in our human journey. Um, hopefully we can respond more appropriately to what's happening uh, if, we're, if we're grown up and if we're woke up. 